Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Diplomacy's project event, The Future of Ukraine, Reconstruction, Energy, Security, and, and Innovation. My name is Ilya Timchenko, and I'm a master's in public policy candidate, the chair of the Ukraine Caucus here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'd like to welcome both our in-person and virtual guests. Also, please be aware that this session is being recorded, that our image may appear, uh, that your uh, image may appear on the recording, and that we may post this video to the Belfer Center's website. I'm very pleased to finally say that we are joined today by Natalie Oresko, uh, former finance minister of Ukraine, Mateo Patron, managing director of uh, Eastern Europe and the caucus at the uh, uh, European Bank uh, for Reconstruction and Development, Vladislav Roshkovan, alternative executive director at the International Monetary Fund, and Daniel Rundy, director of the Project on Prosperity and Development at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. The conversation will be moderated by Ambassador Paula Dabransky, Senior Fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project and former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs. They will discuss a crucial topic, the future of Ukraine and how the country should recover. The new joint assessment released late uh, uh, last month by the government of Ukraine, the World Bank, the European Commission, and the United Nations estimates that the cost of reconstruction and recovery in Ukraine has grown to $411 billion. Though the current official death toll of civilians published by the United Nations is 8,000, Ukraine's crimes prosecutors believe that the figure is closer to a staggering 100,000. Today's speakers will touch upon the financial, humanitarian, economic, and energy developments in Ukraine. Please welcome today's guests. Thank, thank you so much, Ilya. By the way, uh, can all of you hear? Uh, we'll keep the mics where they are, I think. Oh, uh, it's it was kind of placed there so you could both share it and in place. Um, uh, so I'd like to begin uh, with uh, the fact, uh, Ilya, you mentioned that joint assessment that was just released. Uh, he also uh, uh, didn't mention, I, I don't think I heard you, but the IMF are underway. Uh, they're underway with their uh, spring meetings. Um, and so I want to go first, uh, Vlad, to you and also Matteo and then Natalie. Um, what should, let's go right to it. What should Ukraine be prioritizing here? Let's state it very succinctly. In terms of reconstruction, what are the key areas that Ukraine has put forward and that also looking at you with the IMF, uh, Matteo with the EBRD, <coughs> Natalie as former finance minister. Let's dive right in with it. Vlad, please. Thank, thanks for inviting. First, uh, clearly we need to trust our military that we will win the war. It's not a prerequisite for reconstruction for sure, but this is an important factor for, for future you know, prosperity of Ukraine and we, we believe in that. Second is, uh, this is a policy for European Union, we really need to think what to do with refugees because uh, we need to build a country for Ukrainian people or others who want to come to us. Uh, but it's very important to understand if we build it for 40 million people or for 30 million people. And clearly, you know, I was in, in Warsaw speaking uh, in September and they said, uh, people told me, Look, uh, you are, I mean, your people here is at home. I said, look, uh, I would like them to be here as a good guests, uh, you know, because the home is in Ukraine. Mm. And we need to work on that uh, to bring people back. This is a impo very important factor. Like also, we need to think what to do with other social groups which will appear in Ukraine, which is veterans, uh, you know, the families of the fallen soldiers, uh, uh, internally displaced people and refugees. This is important. The third element is... Uh, uh, you know, you, Ambassador, you said about the IMF program. IMF uh, recently approved a new program which builds uh, a, a strong macro framework for the future reconstruction. You cannot build a new country for, on, on the on a moving sand. And uh, the IMF program helps uh, to bring back the policies, uh, uh, do macro adjustment uh, with a new reality of the, let's say, war economy. And this is the first program which would fund finances uh, Ukraine. Important factor which many people are missing is absorption capacity in Ukraine. The agent, Ukraine created an agency, I think we will discuss the institutions later, but uh, Ukraine created the Agency for Reconstruction, which is a you know, renamed uh, former uh, institution for building roads, Ukraftador. Uh, now it's Agency for Reconstruction, but in the best year, 2021, the agency managed to build uh, um, the um, $5.4 billion uh, you know, budget, uh, 
I mean, if you assume $400 billion in the future for reconstruction, it means that it will be for 100 years. We cannot avoid, we cannot uh, accept you know, 100 years reconstruction, therefore we need to build the, the internal absorption capacity, and these are many things. It's not only money, it's people, techniques, uh, institution, etc. And the last thing, uh, I mean, uh, is uh, I don't believe that the country can be rebuilt with a public money. Uh, and we need to do everything possible that the future Ukraine will be mostly privately driven, and therefore we need to bring the private money to, to the reconstruction, not only public money. All Thanks. right. Thank you. Thank you. You got a lot in in a short amount of time. Thank you for that uh, that pithiness. Matteo, let's let's hear from you on the same question. Very difficult to go after Vlad, also because we typically agree on on, on, on this kind of things. But let me let me maybe translate that in uh, in sectors and. Uh, and certainly, indeed, the conditions for the private sector to, to be able to contribute substantially for, to this $411 billion that the second version of the RDNA have uh, indicated is, is absolutely crucial. There is no way this can come from the official sector only. The vast majority of these needs to come from the private sector. So the conditions for that are absolutely crucial, and the fact that the the, on one side, the IMF uh, has concluded the agreement for the standard fast facility, and on the other side, there is a prospect for EU integration, provide a, a fantastic anchor, dual anchor, uh, for, for reforming the country and creating the conditions and the business environment for private sector to come in, both from within the country and from uh, foreign direct investors. And then uh, there is the entire a chapter of uh, of uh, of vital infrastructure in the country, which uh, which is transport, which is uh, vital services to population, water and wastewater, housing, etc., and energy, of course, energy resilience, which uh, is absolutely crucial going forward, and uh, and, uh, and and goes through energy diversification of sources of uh, generation. Uh, the country cannot continue relying uh, for more than 50% generation from a nuclear sector and the rest mainly gas and coal. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you for bringing it another level down. Let me now turn to Natalie. Same question, what you can add to, to that. And by the way, I'm going to add to one piece of introduction from uh, Vlad, uh, of, excuse me, from Ilya, if I may, and that is welcome back, Natalie and Dan. They were former Kennedy School <laughs> students here. So just welcome back. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Natalie, Long please. before this building was built. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just kind of phrase what I would say would be my priorities if I were developing this reconstruction plan, mimicking some of what's been said. But first, how to bring people home. It's our future labor force. It's our future human capacity. So this reconstruction needs to focus on building the homes, the schools, and the jobs in the SME sector to bring 6 million people back home. Second, uh, I agree with Vlad, EU accession. How do we do all of this such that we are simultaneously in parallel moving on that path quickly to EU accession? That means rule of law issues, anti-corruption issues. It means standards. It means we build trains on EU rail gauge, not on Soviet rail gauge, as an example. Um, third, the private sector that, that Matteo talked about, and here some of this overlaps. I mean, the rule of law issues are what the private sector wants, but I, I would go further into attracting private sector, creating the environment that will in, enable something that hasn't happened in 30 years of Ukraine's new independence, massive foreign direct investment. And then lastly, I would say that the whole thing needs to be enveloped in leapfrogging in terms of technologies, leapfrogging in terms of green. So we should be rebuilding green steel, not our own old Soviet steel. We should be using digital technologies as Ukraine has already shown more than its capacity to do, but not only for uh, digital digitizing government, but also using them, for example, for demining. Uh, we talked about this earlier. There are new methodologies for identifying mines, for mining using robotics, using drones. We need to be using the best of 21st and frankly speaking, 22nd century technologies as we think about this reconstruction. All right, thank, thank you for that. I want to put into the conversation what's happening in the G7. We mentioned the IMF spring meetings, but the G7 is very key also and is playing an active role. And Dan Rundy, 
I'm going to go to you because first, uh, CSIS has a commission of which I'm going to say a commission on Ukraine reconstruction yeah. of which you run. I'm proudly a co-chair and Natalie is a commissioner. And the Japanese have been active. Well, it's very significant. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, just last month became the first post-war Japanese prime minister to actually to visit a war zone uh, in traveling to yeah. Kiev. So as Japan takes the leadership uh, and has the leadership of the G7 this year, how do you see Japan's role in this economic re reconstruction? Let's hear from you yeah. on, on this piece. Thanks. It's a privilege to be here. Thanks, Ambassador, for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be on a panel with Nali Jurescu and Vlad Breshkovan and Matteo. Um, uh, Vlad is also an observer to the to the commission's work and has been very helpful. So thank you, Vlad, for all you're doing. Um, on the G7 presidency, we we did a major report on Ukraine reconstruction, and the the we visited Japan because of their uh, their G7 presidency. They are taking it quite seriously, as you can see by the visit by the prime minister. Um, there's several things that Japan can make a contribution on. One is they are a world leader in what's called quality infrastructure. So some of the things that we've talked about, whether it's rail, whether it's airports, whether it's new, uh, new energy infrastructure, they are going to be an, imp an important partner, both uh, there. And they also take a long term view on relationships. Second. Um, we may have to rethink some of the issues around technology. We talked about sort of, you know, leapfrogging. I think there's going to have to be sort of new forms of, of uh, technology and technology backbone in Ukraine um, in, in particular. Uh, third, they have a particular sensibility around issues around disabilities and inclusion. The First Lady of Ukraine has made this an important part of her platform. And so Japan is, is a world leader on inclusion in terms of as we reconstruct, we need to think about all the folks who've been negatively impacted by the war, um, whether in terms of urban planning or using technologies, et cetera. Um, they're also interested as part of their G7 presidency in thinking about issues around insurance. So one of the, there's various forms of insurance issues related to uh, the reconstruction of Ukraine or kind of the current humanitarian emergency. So there's been a, a demand signal from our friends in, the, in, the, in Ukraine asking for specific forms of help, whether it's political risk insurance, but also in terms of other forms of insurance so that regular forms of commerce can continue while this is going on to keep the economy going. All right, uh, Dan, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, the three of you can also add to that if you'd like, but I, I want to go to uh, the question about investors and the environment of the investors. Um, after meeting with the CEO of the world's biggest asset manager last year, President Zelensky said Ukraine needed to both win on the battlefield and, quote, be an attractive country for investors. And obviously, that's, that's, that's very key. And it would be useful to hear from each of you, starting with Natalie, then Vlad, Mateo, and then Dan. What have you heard from the international business community? Uh, uh, you know, what needs to be done in order to make Ukraine an attractive investment? Dan mentioned already uh, insurance. You said that in your comment, but there are other points that need to be made here. Natalie, let's go to you first. Well, I'll say the thing that people don't like to hear, but it has to be said. You cannot wait until the war is over. Most investors are thinking they're going to wait for the cessation, the full cessation, cessation of hostilities. That's too long. Recovery has got to begin now and job creation has to begin now. In addition, due diligence is a long process, depending on the size of your investment. So I urge investors to think about this at, at a minimum as preparing now for what will be a very quick entry when they feel comfortable enough with regard to the level of hostilities. There are parts of Ukraine that have seen less of the hostilities. It's not that there's any part that's been free of it because there isn't. Every single oblast has been bombed or been attacked by missiles or drones or something. But Western Ukraine, for example, is an area where many companies in Ukraine from Eastern Ukraine have moved and reestablished their, their, their operations. A large Irish construction company, Kingspan, has committed to an enormous facility. They're right now identifying land plots. They're right now going through the process of figuring out everything that needs to be done to be able to build that facility as soon as it's possible. Similarly, companies like Unilever, even though they had their facilities destroyed outside of Kiev during the early months of the war, are now committed to rebuilding new facilities, about 20 
um, million dollars worth in a uh, you know, uh, the personal fragrances and personal shampoos and conditioners. So it's possible to start now, but it's certainly even more important to do that due diligence. So I think most investors are saying they want to wait for the cessation of hostilities. And I would say, don't wait. At a bare minimum, do your due diligence, identify your competencies, build your team. It's a long process. As a former private equity investor in Ukraine, there's always risk. The question is how you manage your risk. And that risk can be managed, especially if we get the insurance that Dan talked about. Let, let me ask you just one quick follow-up. What about companies like I've read that JP Morgan Chase has signed an MOU with the Ukrainian government? And then also, I believe BlackRock has done the same. And Goldman. And oh, Goldman. So describe what they're doing precisely here. Well, I think some of that's still secret, and they're not going to announce it for a while. But at least with BlackRock, I know that um, you know it's a focus on getting institutional capital to the, to the market. Uh, strategic investors are used to identifying land plots and building uh, facilities, whether that be in Nigeria or in Ukraine or in other areas of the world. And, and they're more competent and more ready to take that risk. They have brands that they're building and so on. But institutional investors have been very weary and leery of Ukraine globe, you know, for, for the entire 30 years. Um, again, my former private equity firm was one of the few that was able to raise hundreds of millions of institutional capital. Um, and so institutional investors are looking for managers to manage that capital. So um, BlackRock, um, JP Morgan, and uh, Goldman may end up being the managers of some of that capital, but they may be identifying as a fund of funds in an approach, other managers who can put that money to work. Infrastructure and infrastructure funds are going to be a big part of it. If we're going to put money to work, we need funds and, and investors who've been able to do that in large scale, as, as, as Vlad said, so it doesn't take 100 years. So I think the question for all of them is identifying how do you bring institutional investors together? Under whose management do you bring them together? And then advising the government on the conditions that it would take um, as you're speaking to those institutional investors and some say, you know, I'm not ready. Why? Specifically, what? What does the government need to do? I'm not a fan of government incentives, so I'm not going to propose that, but I'm sure many will be asking. If not the Ukrainian government, then what can our G7 governments do? So what should the US government do, for example, in preparing first loss uh, instruments for funds? How can the US government or our, our the G7 governments participate and share again in that risk, that perceived risk, such that institutional investors are ready to put that money into action? Okay, thank you, uh, Vlad. Uh, what's your perspective on this question? You know, I, I think one of the major things uh, which is currently still missing is a vision, is a vision what Ukraine wants after the reconstruction, you know, and this is a, again formal is a discussion on uh, um, who is who is leading the reconstruction. Is it Ukraine or the West? Uh, clearly, it should be Ukraine. But uh, and there are some problems because the war is still ongoing. Uh, there was some at attempt to create a plan, uh, you know, for Lugana conference, uh, which was there was very little buy in uh, from the politicians or that. Uh, but the dialogue on the on the vision of for Ukraine should be there, and it's important also to speak about the words, because Ambassador, you said, uh, um, and and uh, Natalie just now said about the leapfrogging. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but uh, the Vice Prime Minister is named on recovery. You know, the, it's a reconstruction institution. You know, while we clearly need if to, for leapfrog, we need to speak about the modernization. You know, we don't need only to reconstruct uh, what we had by on February twenty third. You know, and if we do that, I think it will be the biggest crime uh, of the 21st century because we will miss the opportunity. It's a drama, it's a tragedy. The, the, the war is a tragedy, but for this specific reason, we really can leapfrog and get rid of the Soviet uh, legacy in uh, infrastructure, in architecture, in the principles of building our cities. Uh, because I agree with Natalka, is that the major part will be on the, on the, on the housing side, on the, on the city side. Uh, uh, on the um, uh, where people will live, uh, and therefore this is very important. The vision is important. The second, I already said about the the capacity. You know, many investors, including the official investors uh, like uh, European Investment Bank, for example, they say they might have money in order to do today. There are not enough projects to finance because, uh, especially on the local level, you need to formulate them. You need to bring them to the language how the you know foreign institutions are working. Uh, and uh, still, this project should be reliable. Speaking about the insurance, uh, I mean, all the foreign investors who we spoke, uh, everybody said about that. Uh, I understand them, and I explained them that people in Ukraine today work without any insurance. 
during the martial law, insurance is not working, but nevertheless, it does not prevent them from investing and rebuilding their factories in Ukraine and operating in Ukraine. For sure, it would, it would be nice to, nice to have. For many investors, it, will, it is a master. And uh, if to go back to the, to the IMF meetings, uh, it is very clear, looking at the Ukrainian, you know, the reconstruction size, which is unprecedented uh, now, that the world uh, appeared not ready you know, for such uh, an instrument like war insurance for such a big, uh, big, big project. There is no insurance market for that. There is no reinsurance market for that. MIGA with their amounts is, I mean, is very little. EBRD is preparing a project. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, they will tell later about that. Uh, but, um, you know, this, the sizes of this project so far are super, super small. They will not cover what is needed. Uh, therefore, we need to come back to that as well. All right. Thank, thank you, Vlad. Matteo, how about from Europe? Uh, give us the perspective there. What are investors talking about? Well, uh, l- l- let me take it again from what, uh, what, what Vlad said about vision. We really need a vision for Ukraine. And that vision needs to be defined by Ukrainians. Because uh, if you really want uh, foreign investors to come in, they, they need uh, to come in, not because there is war insurance. That is needed, yes, but it's, a, it, it, it's an accessory uh, for, for, for attracting uh, interest. But what they need is a business environment and an ecosystem that is palatable and, and attractive for them. And that means rule of law, indeed building back better. So an infrastructure that is not Soviet time infrastructure, but is has the leapfrog uh, um, uh, feature that uh, and, and Natalia mentioned uh, is governance, is predictability. And, and of course, in a market like the Ukrainian one, it means that we have the oligarchized that market and there is not a, a predominant uh, uh, interest uh, where, that can, rule, can bend that rule of law that uh, I was mentioning before. And then there is plenty of opportunities that should open also uh, in, in an economy where 50% or more of banking assets are in the hands of the state-owned banks, the privatization uh, chapter is a major opportunity for both foreign direct oh. investors and institutional yeah. investors. And, 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 and if you have those conditions at the margin that, um, that are there, that would create attraction uh, uh, for a number of people. In the meanwhile, I completely agree uh, again uh, with uh, my predecessors. We need to start working now. We cannot wait for for the cessation of uh, of uh, of the military activity. First of all, because it's not clear how the discontinuity point will be will be will, will, will happen, and 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 because the more we do now, the less we need to do later, and um, and then you need to hinge on your friends, which are both uh, investors that are already in Ukraine uh, from, 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 from abroad, uh, uh, Natalie mentioned uh, um, Unilever. Today, we signed a transaction for more than $45 million with a Polish investor that is already present in Ukraine and more than half of it is going to Ukraine. And we are discussing with a number of investors that are actually either willing to partner with Ukrainian companies or willing to buy Ukrainian companies or are already in Ukraine and they really want to either rebuild their facilities or, 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 or expand them. And then there is the entire uh, entrepreneurial sector of Ukraine made by a number of SMEs, but also made by a number of companies of significant size that can bring with them the entire supply chain. Matteo, thank you. You, I, I'm hearing thus far modernization, privatization, vision. Those are some of the key words. Natalie had a two finger, and then we want to hear from uh, Dan. Uh, just, just very quickly say that we shouldn't ever forget civil society and bringing them into the development of that vision. Hmm. Civil society is the bedrock of Ukraine. It's the bedrock of how Ukraine has become this democratic, incredibly strong, and and uh, fierce. A re- fiercely resistant country, but it's also uh, an element where when you have a plan, I know this from Puerto Rico, and you don't include civil society and you start building schools that maybe or maybe not are what the, what the communities want, uh, you have some trouble afterwards. And so engaging civil society in that vision and in that planning is critical for Ukraine. Hey, thank you, Dan. Uh, you've been traveling around. So same question. 
What have you heard from uh, the international business community? So let me start first with, I think the EBRD is the most important institution maybe you have never heard of, but is, is really important, Mateo, no, and I think you're the, you're the regional development bank for the, you know, for the, for the, you know, the post-Soviet space, if I can put it that way. I think you're going to be one of the critical actors. You're one of the largest uh, supporters of investment in Ukraine, you've been there a long time. You're going to play a uniquely important role. So it's it's really great that you're here. Um, the things that I hear is I also hear this is issue of vision. I would just suggest here's the following as a potential vision. A, a Ukraine with the GNP per capita of Poland, a Ukraine with the agricultural productivity of Canada, a Ukraine with the, uh, the manufacturing capacity of the Czech Republic, and the defense industrial base of Israel. That would be in my mind fully in a membership in EU in the European Union. Let me just say, we've been working on this for the last year. My deepest thought is that we need to have Ukraine fully embedded in the European Union. They've been given a save the date. There's a technical term for it, but they haven't been given the real <laughs> invitation. They need a real invitation from the Europeans now to begin negotiations now. It'll take, the, the land speed record is three years. They're not gonna get it in in three years. It's going to be more like 10 to 12 years, but they need to begin right now. So if you if you said, like, what would be the most important thing is a very strong signal from the European Union, you're, you're really and truly going to become a member. Right now, they've got the save the date. They need to get the real invitation. So the other thing I hear a lot is the issue of corruption, issues of governance and corruption. So we haven't really talked, we've kind of, we haven't talked around this, but it's in the in the conversation. I would just say, the biggest concern people say is, well, we're concerned about corruption. Well, if you look at the corruption rankings for Ukraine, first of all, Russia is a lot more corrupt than Ukraine is. And so I would argue that one of the successes of Russian disinformation is sort of this sort of this thing that's out there. It is there are you know, there are governance challenges in Ukraine. But I, I think that, you know, Russian disinformation has successfully tarred Ukraine in a way that's unfair to the country. So I think. EU accession is a way to say this is going to ultimately th that Ukraine will ultimately follow a path of Poland or other countries like the Czech Republic or the Baltic states. And it means there's going to be an enormous, enormous opportunity. Mateo talked about the privatizations. I mean, if they're done correctly, it's it's enormous. Co companies like Kingspan that were mentioned are basically betting on Ukraine becoming a member of the EU and following this path that I've just described. Uh, Dan, you have the mic. You have the mic. Right. <laughs> I'm like watching you. to make sure you, you have... don't give me the hook. No, no, no. You have the hook. <laughs> you know, oh gosh, gosh okay. No, right. they, Dan, you have the mic, or yeah, at least yeah. at this moment I, you I do. do. Yeah. Yes, uh, on corruption, because that's going to be my next question. So what specific reforms can be undertaken? Let's hear from you, Vlad, Natalie, and then Mateo on that one. So the good news is, is that Ukraine has an independent media. And so that's a really important thing. Uh, it also has a very independent, vibrant civil society that Natalie's talked about. Uh, it's got a series of challenges having to do with judges. And so there's a series of sort of rule of law and judicial issues that are that I think need to be more fully addressed. There's also um, there, the, the requirements for joining the European Union. They have seven buckets of requirements, of which five have to do with what they call governance, basically related to this. So what I've said is, we should not, I mean, when Natalie was finance minister, I think you had 400 different requirements as, from aid agencies. We should just say whatever the EU accession requirements are, like that's everyone ought to copy paste that and follow that. And so what I would say is much of the EU accession requirements are around issues of specific governance reforms. There are these five buckets. And so my view is, that, and they've made some progress. They'll tell you the, your, the Ukrainian government will tell you because we hosted the the vice the prime the vice prime minister whose job it is to just focus on this. Say like we are making progress on this. We should take the Ukrainians at their word, and we should be supporting in a number of different areas. But I'd say the the judicial system in particular is an area of of additional work. I'll All right, uh, Vlad, uh, com please comment on this next, Vlad. Yeah, I, I would say three things uh, clearly should be done. One is uh, uh, and and two of them are about let's say like a quadrat or a square if you assume in your in your eyes uh, in vision your eyes. So the the the, the square is uh, the size uh, of the state uh, economy, let's say like this, or state functioning, and you need to do decreasing this square on two sides. Uh, one is you decrease need to decrease uh, what the government is controlling 
And uh, unfortunately, during COVID, during the war, the role of government substantially increased. We need, for the future, we need to decrease it. Uh, and therefore, mean, this means what, uh, what Matteo was saying about also in privatization, for example, including privatization of banks. Uh, this is uh, bringing private capital there, should decrease the, the level of problems of governance. And the second thing is how the government is controlling. This is a deregulation. And this is what Natalka government was doing a lot. Uh, we need to continue that. It was continued in the last years, not maybe in its full speed. Uh, and therefore, the size of the, of the square, the size of the state economy and state control will, will, will be lower. And this is what uh, the, the, um, the Dan said. Uh, and later you do the digitalization you know, of, the, of the remaining part. You substantially reduce the role of the individuals in decision-making. You make build more automatic systems. The government now, the Vice Prime Minister um, Fedorov now is doing a lot of that, but there is the element which also Natalka was saying about the civil society. Civil society has a strong voice there, and there is a, a team which names Rice Coalition, Rice Ukraine Coalition. These are people who also were behind building the uh, the Prozora, Prozora sales system, which are world recognized and got global awards for the public procurement. Now they are in the process of building the new digital system for the reconstruction, for controlling reconstruction, in order to make it transparent, effective, and also in a digital way. And I should be very frank, if you go to the books uh, about reconstructions, the last thing which you can find about the digital systems is more or less 15 years ago, mm. you know? And that's why it means that this will be, I'm sure, will be a benchmark for other countries in the future. You know, because, I mean, in 15 years, the technology went so far. And these teams are very, very good. They understand how to work both with government and international partners. Uh, they work with World Bank and others. Uh, so I'm, uh, there is already a better version, which is on, you know, go going. I'm sure this will, will be also helpful both for the government and the private sector. We're going to be hearing now from Natalie and Matteo on this question. And then I have one last question, which is going to be directed at Matteo. But why I'm flagging this is because be thinking about your questions. We're going to go to here in person and also online uh, if there are those uh, from online. All right. So, Natalie, on this question. A couple quick principles. Number one, corruption is human nature. I'm from Chicago. I lived in Ukraine and I lived in Puerto Rico. Okay. It's not unique to Ukraine. What's unique to Ukraine is the weakness of the judicial system. When you don't have the expectation of a free and fair judicial hearing, you make decisions differently, whether to offer bribes or to take bribes. And so judicial reform from my perspective is the absolute number one issue. We need to create in Ukraine substantial disincentive to cheating on your taxes, to bribing your customs official, to taking a bribe as a customs official. Until those disincentives exist across the system, human nature overrules it. In other societies, again, I'll take Chicago, not to be, uh, I feel <laughs> comfortable saying that, you know, people do what they believe they can get away with. When several former governors are sitting in jail, it's a reminder that no one's above the law. In Ukraine, we don't have that judicial system yet. And I believe that the anti-corruption institutions that have been created are an artificial, uh, solution to a much deeper, broader problem. And if those anti-corruption institutions are making examples of government officials who've actually done their work legally in accordance with the law, which is you see a few cases of that recently, that is going to be a disincentive to anyone serving in government in the future. So we need to be very careful. Corruption has to be defined. Corruption is something illegal, not doing your job in accordance with the law. But again, the judicial reform is number one. The second is transparency in governance at every level. Transparency is what enables a civil society to be participating. Transparency in procurement, transparency in budgeting. Look at how your taxpayer dollars are being spent and say something if you disagree. Um, so transparency in all of this and that transparency then, and if, you, if you bring it down to corporate governance at state-owned enterprises, while you're privatizing them, you need transparency in all the decision-making and all of the finances of that state-owned enterprise. And then finally, I think the government of Ukraine with its donors needs to urgently agree on a system of compliance and monitoring that everyone can agree, and I won't comment on whose system it should be, but everyone can agree provides, again, stakeholders in Ukraine and stakeholders outside of Ukraine with the confidence that this process is completely transparent to each and every one of you if you want to go online and see what road is being built, what the width of that road is, what the depth of the asphalt that's being laid is, and that G GPS is looking down and measuring that 
constantly during the construction process. And you're seeing that measurement throughout the, at this time. Those types of systems, as Vlad say, weren't used in the past, they exist today. We need donors to agree on one and the Ukrainians to use that and give confidence to everyone. It's possible. Mateo, additional points that you may have on this issue of corruption. And then I have a single question for you on a different topic. Okay, thanks, Paula. Well, no much to add. The only thing I can add is that uh, in terms of reforms and in particular in terms of uh, reduction for, of space for corruption, Ukraine has made huge progress since Maidan. And that should be recognized. Uh, Vlad mentioned uh, Prozoro, but there are a number of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of examples of that. So we need to continue that going forward. And we need to couple that with, with, with an enhanced rule of law, as, as Natalie said. The, the problem is that uh, there is a reduction of space for corruption, but when, when corruption happens, people are not, are not punished for that. And this is where, uh, where the, the big effort needs to be done without trying to cut corners with uh, legislation that uh, would, would probably not pass the scrutiny of the European Union or Venice Commission of, or, or, or people like that. But now I'm very curious about the question. The question. Me. Well, you, you <laughs> mentioned in your, uh, your uh, uh, comments on the first, uh, first question I posed, you referenced energy, and I wanted to circle back to that uh, question with you, because we know that Ukraine has been one of the most energy intensive countries in the world. And so the question for you is how can and what role does the West have in Ukraine's energy transition uh, going forward? It's a key area. Let's dive a little bit deeper and let's hear from you on that. Well, it's, I think the, the, the West or international partners, and again, the private sector has a huge has a huge role to play there. Uh, the official sector has a huge role to play in terms of overall infrastructure, in particular in transmission uh, and, and the support of, of actors like Ukrainergo that are doing a fantastic and heroic work in, in keeping the lights on. And by the way, not many know that since last week, Ukraine has started exporting again energy in particular to Moldova, that is another very vulnerable country in the area. So really, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing demonstration of resilience and defiance. And, but going forward, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, energy resilience, that goes through energy diversification. And, and that goes through the building back better than Natalie was, was mentioning. So increase of uh, renewable energy resources, increase of storage in leapfrogging technology and that is the role that the private sector can can uh, can play through concessions ppps feeding tariff mechanisms but in order for that to work you need predictability and and, and this is where um the the ukrainian authorities have a very big role to play in order to ensure that predictability which has not always been there all right, well, th thank you for that. Let's open it up uh, here. Uh, we have a good number of people here. Um, and I'm wondering, do we have, uh, are we gonna use a mic? Cause we can maybe take one of the mics here and then we'll share this one. And we have a question in front and then I, and we have one here. Okay, we're doing ladies first, all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. And you have to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, I'm very glad to see all the panelists. My name is Svetlana. I'm a Harvard Business School student, basically graduating very soon, and I'm very pleased to see uh, lots of panels in person. And I'm also very happy to see my former boss, Matteo, on the screen. <laughs> uh, and, and, yeah, he doesn't see me, And actually, I will have two questions. And the first one would be to Matteo, and the second one would be to any panelists who would like to address that one. Uh, so, Matteo, the question I have, uh, I would say, is about you know, the Ukraine absorption capacity by EBRD. And what I mean by that is that in uh, the year when I was still with EBRD, we invested over a billion dollars in the Ukrainian economy, and it was a record investment, it was huge, and it made EBRD as a top institutional investor in the country. Right now, Ukraine definitely needs more than a billion from various institutions. So I'm wondering what the realistic expectation of what EBRD, perhaps other development institutions, can commit to Ukraine, given that there are sort of internal restrictions that can actually stand against that one. So basically your estimations on what, what can what investment of EBRD and similar institutions we can expect to 
expect the Ukraine in coming years. And the second question to all the panelists is actually about the industries. I hear a lot of discussions about what the top industries are usually what we talk is agriculture, infrastructure, energy, which is extremely important. But what I'm a little bit disappointed in the discussions is that people discuss very little some of more modern industries. For example, a few days ago, I was at HBS, MIT, National Security and Tech Conference. And the skill people talked about was uh, cybersecurity and the ability both to fight cyber attacks and to recover soon after cyber attacks. That's the skill Ukrainians have right now because unfortunately we get daily training. Same about drones. I mean, the applications of drones are immense from uh, agriculture to insurance to goods delivery. So what is the thinking about incorporating all the skills that we unfortunately had to acquire during the war to ensure our prosperity in peaceful times? All right. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, uh, Matteo, let's go on the first question to you. And then we'll uh, catch on the panel the second question relevant to cyber cybersecurity. OK, so uh, first of all, very, very nice to hear from you, Svetlana. Unfortunately, I cannot see you there, but uh, <laughs> but very, very nice to hear from you. And uh, look, uh, you, you're absolutely right. The issue of absorption capacity is of paramount importance. The, the way we are looking at this and, and the absorption capacity issue is twofold. On one side is, is financial absorption capacity. There are a number of uh, municipalities or a number of SOEs that have breached their limit for debt sustainability. And, and therefore we need to find different instruments for that. And the other issue, which to me is more, is more important and, and more problematic to, to, to tackle is the ability to prepare and then implement projects. Uh, for the first one, the way we look at uh, our intervention in the country is, is our ability to deploy finance. Uh, and, and it really doesn't matter whether it's, it's debt, it's, it's stuff that goes on our balance sheet, or is uh, the partnership we have with a number of donors that will partner with us in order to deploy finance to companies. Let me take a couple of examples. One is is what we have done with Naftogaz last year. We provided Naftogaz with alpha billion uh, um, dollars package, out of which 300 million euros were a BRD finance and, uh, and almost another 200 million euros were a grant provided by, by the Norwegian uh, government in order to allow Naftogaz to buy gas and, 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 and survive the winter. Similarly, for Ukrainergo, we have provided 450 million euros of debt ourselves and another 70 million euro grant for from the Dutch government and 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 going forward the grant intensity of what we're going to deploy in the country is going to most probably increase and this is going to be very true for uh, for a number of municipalities that are not uh, uh, that have the debt capacity of uh, of cities like Kiev or Viv or, or Dnipro for instance on, if, if I may, Paul, just a, a quick comment on, 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 on the sectorial focus, uh, sure. moving from agriculture to modern industries. Again, I completely agree with Anna with you. And, and even in agriculture, should, we, should, we should think about vertical integration. We should stop thinking about primary farming only, but we should move into more value-added segments. Yeah. The reason why I think there is a huge opportunity in Ukraine is because uh, because the, the biggest resource of the country is not is not agricultural land is not raw materials is is the human capital of of the country and I've been convinced of that since I moved there at the end of 2018 and and, and in the latest months I had unfortunately a very strong evidence that I'm right in that assessment and and the fact that the IT industry is thriving so much in the country, the fact that there are a number of uh, of of companies and and uh, that are, are are leading edge worldwide uh, is a is a is a testament of this. So uh, completely agree. We need to think well beyond primary farming in the country. All right, thank you for that. And by the way, before I pass the mic down for Natalie and for Vlad, and then I don't know if Dan has something on this one. But uh, uh, an apology, by the way, to those watching online, um, just the shape of the room. And then we have four of us here, fifth one on screen, and the camera is situated not in the most convenient way. As you could see, we kind of fill up the screen. <laughs> so let me, but our apologies, but uh, glad we have an active audience here. Uh, Natalie, over to you on this. Two quick things. 
<clears throat> one in terms of absorption capacity. I think we have to frame this the way, at least for the Americans in the room, what we understand. Let's take a one day hurricane, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, which is 166, 166 the size of Ukraine. The reconstruction of a one day hurricane event, which by the way is about 80, 90 billion dollars of damage. So you can imagine that what's been predicted by the World Bank is an underestimate in the end of what's going to be damaged in Ukraine. 166 a size. The expectation is best case scenario about 15 years to restore the damage of a one day hurricane. So I think we all need to kind of frame this. New Orleans took after Hurricane Katrina about 15 years to rebuild. And that's with the capacity of the whole United States, right? In terms of labor, in terms of engineering equipment. So I think the capacity issue is huge, but I also don't think we should be surprised that this is a 20 or 30 year or longer process. In terms of why we don't talk about IT or weapons or armaments, which Ukraine certainly uh, is expertise at, I don't often include it because I look at that not as reconstruction. To me, that's growth of new sectors where we become competitive, and that's part of when we build a business environment that's conducive. All kinds of things in my mind are going to be coming from there. But when we talk about reconstruction, I focus in on what damage has been done in terms of demining the land in terms of housing, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of energy, and how you're going to rebuild. But there's no question that Ukraine will, it does today and will excel in everything related to IT, including cyber, as well as in weapons and armaments, because we've done an enormous uh, amount of work on bringing technology to the battlefield. Vlad. You know, I, I, try, I will try to move <coughs> the questions to, to one answer. Uh, I remember uh, talking with a uh, prime minister in 2017, uh, who was that time slightly com was complaining about the minister of economy of that time, you know, who was saying uh, and telling me that he didn't tell me which industries I should develop. And my answer was, you sh she should not tell you which industries you should develop. What you need to do is on the on the road between Odessa and Kiev, put the power cable or every five kilometers and the, and the digital board registering enterprise and connecting to this electricity. And this is what about the deregulation and reforms are saying, because if today you have a field, uh, which is a, you know, could be destroyed city, you know, so it's just empty uh, and you have $10 billion on the table, you will not be able to restart, to start building. So you will have to come to all these regulatory issues, you know, starting from land, starting from connecting to electricity, to water, to sewage, et cetera. And this is not about reconstruction. This is a regular, you know, uh, regulatory job in Ukraine. And this is also should be addressed in parallel. And there is no any excuse not to do it today, even if there is a uh, hot war was ongoing. But I fully agree with, uh, with uh, Natalka that in general, this question today is not 100% correct. It's not about the industries to be reconstructed. You, you will not be able to do it. You need to move from the words industries to geographies because destroying the cities. And the city is, you take, uh, you know, from urban planning, from strategy of the city, why the city they exist, not because of it exists yesterday. Maybe there is nobody, you know, to, to come back. Maybe people who are living there because it was historical Soviet legacy people were there and they are due to the low mobility, people could not move. But now, you know, the people already were forced to move, huh? you know, maybe there is another way to do it for internally displaced people. You can build for them housing in another place. This is a coming back to the vision. You know, the, the World Bank cannot estimate that, you know, because the World Bank will do mechanical arithmetic calculation of build back better for the, for the city which was destroyed. And therefore, I mean, this is about urban planning, this is about roads, this is about the water supply, this is about the sewage, let us speak about housing, let us speak about schools, public buildings, stadiums, parks, uh, you know, and, and later on top of that, there will be a lot of businesses, supermarkets, warehouses, pro factories, production, you know, the and, and, et cetera. So this is not an industry. You, you really need to go back to the geographies and the cities as a as an atomic, uh, uh, speaking about the reconstruction. And in future, I strongly believe it will be not a competition between industries in Ukraine, because this is what Natalka was saying, and we didn't go deeper and for, yet, uh, well, that is a labor force. I think that the cities will be competing for people, you know, and this is, will be in future, and also for business. And this is because of Ukrainian deregulation. Cities have uh, a lot of a lot of power, and this is what I see in the future. Th thank you, Vlad. And let me give Dan a chance very, here. Very briefly, I would just say two things. I, I think Ukraine ultimately needs to become a member of NATO. That would be my preference. 
if they don't become a member of NATO, we're going to have to have a strategic relationship with Ukraine the way we have with Israel. That means, in my mind, we're going to need that Ukraine's going to need a very sophisticated defense industrial base. There's been some discussion about this, but think about Finland or Sweden that were not members of NATO but had very sophisticated defense industrial bases. So it's beyond cyber. It's it's all the things that Natalie was talking about. I think we're going to have to, as part of that, if they're going to get access to the good stuff in terms of our our security uh, data. I think we're going to have to have a real conversation about the fact that Huawei is the, the telecom backbone in Ukraine. And I personally think we're probably going to have to have a real adult conversation about this because I don't think that's going to fly. The second thing I would just say is that they um, the, the tech sector is about 4% of the GMP of Ukraine. If you talk about the creative economy, which is like tech and art and design and um, it, there, it could be as high as 10% in a future Ukraine. I mean, it, it's a democracy. It's, there's freedom of expression. There's freedom of religion. There's freedom of association. There's a free press. There's a value. The, the society values art and culture in a profound way. Um, so you could easily see 10%. You could see a doubling of the creative economy in a future Ukraine. I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have a question right here, and she's bringing the mic. And then we'll come over to both of you on this side. Sir, so thank you very much, Ted Truman from the Masavar Romani Center for Business and Government. So, uh, this has been a very fascinating uh, discussion, very realistic and optimistic at the same time. So, I congratulate you for it. Uh, I'm interested in the question of the, uh, of the judicial reform. Uh, this may be a question from Mateo, because it strikes me that that's how do you go about judicial reform uh, in, a, in, a, in a country? It must be pose special kinds of political questions. And I assume that the EPRD has had some experience in this, but I'd be interested in, in your ideas about how you get from here to there in terms of judicial reform. Uh, and it strikes me it's not an easy thing to do. You can't wave your hand and say, we're going to replace it. But maybe you can, but replace the judiciary. Okay, uh, Mateo, that was tossed to you. And uh, Dan, uh, uh, did you want to come? Oh, I uh, thought you no, had Mateo your hand first. up. Okay, and, and Natalie. Okay, Mateo, please. Okay, so f f first of all, judicial reform is not really the bread and butter of a bank like the BRD. We, 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 it is, this is the work of bilateral uh, partners. Uh, and, uh, but it's important in this context uh, that, that those bilateral partners coordinate with each other. I, I, I remember uh, well before the conflict having, because judicial reform is so important for business, having uh, studied the, um, the, the, the math, the five uh, <laughs> for, for a bit of time and, and, and having interviewed a number of bilateral uh, uh, partners of Ukraine, the, 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 the picture that emerged from that was that everybody was going in his or her own direction with very little coordination uh, uh, among them or between them. These cannot happen anymore. Uh, we, we don't have the benefit of time. We don't have the luxury of wasting any other uh, time and resource on, on this matter. There must be a coordinated action by, by, by in the international community in, in every field of, uh, of, uh, of recovery in Ukraine, but in particular when it comes to judicial reform and rule of law. Um, so the, 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 the steering committee that has just been formed and, and, uh, and is led by the US, the EU and Ukraine, uh, if there is one one area where it needs to to focus in terms of coordination, this is the one. All right, thank you, Matteo. Uh, Natalie, did you you want to add to this? Um, just you know, there is an example of doing a whole scale reform like this, even in a large country. When we did the national police reform in Ukraine, I think it's the best example. There was zero to no confidence in the police. It was an inherited militia with Soviet tendencies and practices, and the only way to deal with that was one day. They were all fired. And everyone had to reapply for their jobs. Everyone had to go through mandatory training. And they got renamed, reclothed, retrained. And that's basically what the judicial reform is going to have to do. You're going to have to say at some point, everyone has to reapply. 
and you identify what those skill sets are, what that experience is. Everyone has to be retrained. Now, they, there have been attempts at doing this. Don't I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like Ukraine hasn't tried to do judicial reform. It's just an enormous task. And in the interim, there are ideas that have been used in other countries. For example, establishing a court for foreign investors that could rely on foreign judges using Ukrainian law. So with respect to respect to the Ukrainian law, but where you would have in the interim, while this judicial reform is happening, if it has to go on for too long, foreign investors might be able to have more confidence in a local court in the short term. I was just going to add, there are other cases in other countries of where judicial reform has taken place. And I think there are elements that could be drawn from. It is an overwhelming task, as we've said. Normally, as moderator, I don't jump in. But on this one, because I, I served in the Human Rights Bureau in the State Department years ago, this is a central issue. And for even moving aside business investment, just for the uh, preservation of human rights. Uh, in country. So I'm I'm optimistic on it. It's implementation here that really matters. We had two questions over here, Vlad and Dan. I'm going to let you guys, I think, on this. Let's take both of your questions. So if you'll go first, introduce yourself and pass the mic back. Thank Thanks. you so much for the discussion. Um, I'm Yulia Lamish, um, Mid Korea Master of Public Administration here at HKS, uh, originally from Ukraine. So um, one top, one one talking about the priority for Ukraine for all these refugees they knew and people to, to go back, right? And obviously for us, to, for the government to attract them back home. I keep thinking about those um, millions of mostly women and kids. Uh, for them to actually go back home, we really need um, the education recovery to be the priority. But unfortunately, I did not hear this, you know, in all those conversations. Well, and it's clear why, because it's it's not that sexy that you can, you know, pitch to investors in terms of like um, return on investment. Um, and this is something that government in the majority of cases needs to take care of. But how, how do we think about it? Do, do we, how do we think about attracting investment into you know, educational sphere and maybe be creative in this regard that these women and kids actually go back home? Thank you. And let's get yours too, if, if you don't mind. Could you, you had a question. Yes, yeah, um, we're gonna take both. Okay, good morning, okay. everyone. Uh, my name is Konstantin Yusuf. I'm, I'm acting deputy mayor of Kiev, and I'm also completing my um, CMPA degree here at HKS. So good to see you all. Um, special compliments to Natalka, who I've been privileged to vote for as a former member of parliament uh, as a our finance minister. And, and the first question goes to you, Natalka. So since you've been there, uh, since you've seen Ukraine and being a part of government apparatus, You've seen people, you work with them. What mistakes should not be repeated in Ukraine, by Ukraine, after war? Um, the second question goes to anyone who wants to take it. And it has something to do with uh, Vlad's comment on lacking vision. Um, and I, and, and I, share, I share this um, doubt, and I also feel very I feel worried about that because we only have so many architects, so civil civil engineers, and professionals in government. And uh, even though the war has brought sympathy and recognition to Ukraine, it has not brought more people to Ukraine. It's actually the opposite. We have less professionals now. Um, so our capacity, our bandwidth, to actually plan this vision out is even lower than before. We have not gained additional expertise that might be useful during the reconstruction and build re big rebuilding process, especially when it comes to 20 to 30 years long projects. Um, how do you think this capacity might be built? Who should be the parties that invest in this capacity bandwidth building process. Thank you. All right, thank you. I took both of your questions I together. I'm gonna to give Vlad a chance to go first. I like mixing it up and then Dan, and then we'll come to to, to you. So there's a range, education, you yeah, heard. I will, okay. I will start with uh, your education. Um, there are two elements here. I strongly believe that education is a differentiating factor for people to come back to Ukraine or not. 
because now when a lot of women move to, to Europe, they have gone now for the first cycle of the school this year. They saw the difference. When they go the second cycle next year, it's almost given, kids will stay there. This is, I see why I said in the beginning about refugees. I see this is as the biggest issue for Ukraine for the future. Because, uh, I mean, as we know from, you know, from this, from, from, from studying here, that the major cost which government has for, 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 for people is when it's on a birth. So the first few years of life. As soon as these kids already six, seven, eight years, the cost of for them, them for the government of Poland or Czech Republic or other countries is minimal. This is their future it will be. And sorry, but Poland is our friends. They are very happy that these one million people came to find a job there now. And it will be a some moment, it will be a contradicting policies uh, when we will say we need to have policies to bring people back. Uh, and they will say we will have policies to keep them there, believe me. But we need to also to be thinking, and this is what, uh, what Dan was saying, we need to be ready that as soon as Ukraine enters the European Union, this is absolutely freedom. People go, can go, there is a mobility, people could go. So factually, they, we already, these people already today behave uh, as, uh, uh, as Europeans. We believe we know we are Europeans, you know, in our heart, in our nature. There are not so many people in the world dying under European flags. Uh, and uh, we are, I mean, people already live, they don't have now the election rights, actually, but all other access to all the public goods, uh, in, including education they have. And education for the for my generation, you know, like, a, let's say 35 plus, 45 plus, uh, you know, where kids are at school age, uh, the, the school will be differentiated. But when the people come back, uh, it's very interesting that school is not the first factor so far. First is going security, the second goes job, the third goes pharma, you know, the, the access to medicine, and the fourth goes school. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we do not need to work on that, for sure. And we have a new minister. I was I was speaking with a deputy minister on the way here. So we hope we have some hopes that they will put some uh, some attention for, for the education because they understand this is a differential factor. Going back to the, the to the second question, but we have too many architects um, and uh, you know the capacity, uh, etc. I'm not so optimistic there. And while I'm optimistic on the vision, you know, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm optimistic on the vision. So I didn't say I have any doubt that we will have a vision. The vision will come from Ukraine. I hope it will be as brave as a Ukrainian military and not only, you know, trying to recover what we had on February 23, but truly saying the first generation of professionals who I would change would be architects. You know, I don't want all Ukraine would look like Bosniki. Sorry. You know, I want it looks like Amsterdam, you know. And uh, this is, a, I mean, you said about how to bring this capacity. If anyone, do they ask anyone in the world, the most, most famous architectural bureaus, they come to Ukraine, work for free. No doubt. Everybody wants to be engaged today. So it's a question of our call, you know, not for... Ukrainian Kiev based developers and architects to build what they had before or other cities. We need to be brave. We need to invite the best agencies. And I was speaking last week so, with a lot of the government officials from France, from Netherlands, from Belgium, from other set, to not only think about how to give money to government and what, what uh, Natalka was saying about civil society, build already projects today, especially in architecture, in the design, on the urban planning, to have projects together, Ukrainian people with. Uh, with European in order to in order to work together. Thank you, Vlad. And uh, I know you directed it to Natalie, so you we're coming to her in one moment on the second question. Again, okay. we're going to give Just you a chance. We need jobs, uh, housing, and schools. And so I do think there's a role for donors in terms of responding to this issue of housing in particular and making sure that the schools are up and running. Those are the two minimum prerequisites of folks to come back. I think in an age of Zoom, I also think as well, we need to leverage technologies to leverage all of that capacity, even at a distance level. Okay. Sorry, I forgot, I forgot to say housing for sure. So the questions are related in my mind. If I, if I look at the biggest mistakes, number one is use the crisis. Uh, political support for difficult change is always very short. If I slept two hours a night for that 16 months, I should have slept only one. Um, there is no time 
like the moment that you can make these reforms, you have to do them as rapidly as possible and not breathe because that time disappears. And then the political support for the reforms goes away. People think it's good enough. You're growing at 2%, that's good. 2% isn't good enough. So one is use the crisis and act with absolute urgency. But related to that is the capacity and education question. Who's going to act? Now the EBRD was very good at putting in reform units into some of the ministries, maybe all the ministries by now. <clears throat> but because civil service is so poorly paid, motivating people to take the jobs who are not corrupt is very difficult. So how do we build a salary structure that will enable reasonable people, educated people to come back? And how do we welcome them with open arms? I was involved in the Orange Revolution trying to get professionals to come back and work in government. I was a minister trying to get them to work in government after the um, Revolution of Dignity. And we're going to have another chance. There are Ukrainians now all over the world, very well educated, including yourselves. How do we get you to come home? What is it going to take? Most importantly, often, what it takes is knowledge that you're going to have a useful role, that you're not going to be relegated to some back office. And that has been a challenge for Ukraine, to be perfectly honest. I collected probably 5,000 resumes after the Orange Revolution. I think two people got jobs. So how do we enable that capacity? And education and educated people are a big part of it. But they're not necessarily being given the openings to play the role that they could play. And not just in government, everywhere, in private sector, in NGOs and so forth. Vlad just had a quick- Yeah, I, I think the, the answer to the question which Natalka ju just said uh, is an opportunity. You know, the reconstruction of Ukraine, which will be you know, a 500 billion, $1 trillion exercise for 10, 15 years, as, uh, as Natalie said, uh, it's an opportunity. Opportunity is a huge project for any professional. It's, I mean, you dream to have this possibility to be part of such things. And this opportunity, if it will be created, it will be paid. I mean, it will become a magnet for many people, including within the European Union and, and beyond. By the way, did you have a reaction to what you've heard? Did you have a reaction to what you heard? You had an official position as deputy mayor. And, uh, as deputy mayor. So, yeah, but I'm here in purely personal capacity I, I, no, as a student of okay. this no, great institution. Okay, thank well, you, thank okay. You all right. Well, I, I just thought because you know you had a an official role, and not I'm not saying in that capacity, but did you have an opinion in your own personal capacity that you'd like to share? I mean, you have heard a reaction. Did you have a, a view no, yourself? Just to contemplate what has been said. Okay. All right. All right. Is, it um, are, is there another question from the audience? Because if not, let me, I have, uh, and Matteo, I'm going to go to you first. And actually, we're going to do uh, uh, going from you and then just down the line. Uh, first, just a broad question. What do you want to impart to this audience about Ukraine reconstruction today? What is, you know, what is the most important uh, a message that you think is crucial to impart. And secondly, maybe I should have flipped this. You know, some people are talking and debating about Marshall Plan, and we haven't used that term. Now, at the time, the Marshall Plan was actually, um, uh, you know, established. Congress had dubbed it Operation Rat Hole, okay? And there's a real debate about it. Should there be a Marshall Plan or not a Marshall Plan? So the two questions, maybe Marshall Plan first, and then secondly, uh, what message is most crucial for you to impart today? And we'll go straight down the line. You first, and then Vlad, Natalie, and then Dan Lundy. Uh, on, on Marshall Plan, look, there are a number of initiatives by a number of government and a number of institutions that are now already taking place. Uh, uh, inventing a new one, uh, probably, uh, or reinventing a new one, probably is, is not really the, the, the way to go about it. Uh, I think what is actually needed now is a stronger and closer and more effective coordination among uh, all of us that care about the future of Ukraine. And uh, I mentioned the steering committee uh, that uh, has been formed. I see the body language of them. And, uh, and <laughs> has taken way too much time to be to be to be set up but we it then is what we have now and uh, and uh, and uh, let it give, give a chance uh, i think the, the the first two meetings were very constructive there are a number of uh, satellite uh, venues 
that um, will uh, support the work of, of this steering committee, which is for the audience is co-led by the US, the EU and Ukraine. Uh, I, I think this is where we need to, to focus our efforts and, uh, and, um, and make sure that uh, that is a, is, is a winning proposition. Okay. When it comes okay. to the message to the, the audience, I, I think it's, I, I would go back to what Natalie said at the beginning. The reconstruction begins now, actually has already begun a, 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 a couple of, of, of a few months ago uh, with the emergency repairs of Ukrainergo, with the companies that are moving from the east to the west, with the companies that are rebuilding their facilities and they continue operating. Look, I was, I was in Viv a month ago and we went to visit a very tiny operation of a, of a, um, of a car um, tire uh, uh, exercise. Uh, you know, 20, 20 employees, no more than that. They've been shelled in April 2022. One month later, they restarted operations. They had four casualties. When we went there, because we, 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 we were directed there, we, we, we thought that we were in the wrong place because everything was working perfectly. <laughs> and then we spoke with the daughter of the owner and said, no, no, you are in the right place. And uh, I'll show you how the, the, the facilities uh, looked uh, the day after the, the shelling. And, and, and it's amazing what they've done. And, uh, and so I, I don't really buy into this argument. We need to wait for the cessation of the hostilities in order to start the construction. That is utterly wrong okay. and is incredibly dangerous. All right, thank you. We have five minutes before we close. Vlad, I'm giving you the mic. So uh, martial law and what's your core message? Just a very simple one, two line message. Martial law and martial law are different things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we need to have a, to avoid martial law to have a martial plan? As Mateo now said, no, we need to have a martial plan. Um, uh, I mean, I'm thinking martial law in terms of time, sorry. <laughs> the, um, Your I, sorry. I already said it many times, and sorry if I will repeat this. Uh, um, I don't believe in the martial plan for Ukraine. We are in a different environment today. We were in international financial architecture. And, uh, you know, in general, there are many things that are a lot of written already about that. There is not a martial plan for, for Ukraine, but I believe in the martial plan for Europe. Because Europe managed to get to the, to, get to, the uh, to the trap of uh, Russian energy, China technologies, uh, and Europe became too bureaucratic, and they need to use the two projects which are already in place, uh, which is Next Generation EU, which is also about the climate, the Free Seas Initiative, which is a huge infrastructural project. And to add the reconstruction of Ukraine, these will be the composition of the future Europe. And uh, this is together, will be difficult to, comp to manage, but we need to do this. This is what I would name Marshall Plan for Europe. Speaking about the, the message, Live in Ukraine, be ambassadors of Ukraine. And if you, a professor, bring this topic to your students, discuss it with them. I'm sure you will have good ideas. If you're a student, ask your professors what lessons from other cases could be could be learned for the Ukrainian reconstruction and bring this to Ukraine. So I have two things for you to take away. Number one, this is going to be the most exciting opportunity in our living history. And think about how you individually, you and your organizations can participate. Amen. Everyone in the best of the best, from architecture to green, to technology, to arts, to culture, to education, everyone is going to want to be there and be a part of this. So think about how you can partake. And second, in the interim, think about how any aid or assistance that you're providing can help build that human capacity. Teach for Ukraine, which puts fellows into schools. Superhuman Center, which is bringing mental health and, uh, and prosthetics to people. Uh, the Zelenska Foundation has a, a project where they're collecting digital technology, laptops, mobile uh, phones for children in schools. It can all go through Washington, through Ukraine House. There are multiple ways to help today to build that human capacity for tomorrow and help create those, that capacity in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Vlad, I certainly did mean Marshall Plan. <laughs> okay. So Ukraine's got to win the war, and we need to provide them with everything that they need to win the war. 
the second thing is this EU accession thing. I can't explain how important this is. This is about taking the, all the opportunities, all the changes, the gravitational pull of EU accession is critical to this. And the third is, is that there's not enough foreign aid to rebuild Ukraine, but that foreign aid is an important component of rebuilding Ukraine. The Marshall Plan for Ukraine is a good kind of mental shorthand that everyone kind of gets like, oh, I get it. So it's, so I think it's a good kind of shorthand to say like we're making a big multi-year like a, a generational commitment to Ukraine that this is going to be a strategic partner of the way we think about Israel or Jordan we're going to have that kind of relationship and I would say something like the statistic is something like 19 of 20 of the U.S.'s largest trading partners have been foreign aid recipients some most of them are not foreign aid recipients anymore and so if we think about that country like Poland it doesn't get foreign aid anymore Whatever we put into it in the first 10 years of kind of after the, the you know, after 1989, they're, they're buying multiples of that every year of American goods and services. So this is, a, if we take, play the long game, and if you look at as Poland as a burden share in terms of security burden share, as a foreign aid provider, as a par economic partner, it's a totally different volume. We need to think about 25 years from now to, to Natalie's point, this is going to be a generational, enormous opportunity if, if the planet or of the planets align correctly. And I'm optimistic. Let me just say one thing that hasn't been said. I would say I've had, I don't know, uh, 50 conversations about this, and I'd say it comes up every time. Is the United States going to flake on Ukraine? Is the U.S. going to wobble on Ukraine? Right. And so I think the question is, is the Republican Party going to wobble on Ukraine is sort of what is the is the sub. Right. That's the question I always get. So 80 percent of the Republicans in the House and 80 percent of the Republicans in the Senate voted for the Ukraine supplemental last May. That's the truth. Now, you hear lots of crazy people say lots of crazy things, but 80 percent. And now, do I think it's today 80 percent? I don't know. Do I think it's more than 50 percent? Yes, I do. And so I think nothing beats success. And so what we want is for Ukraine to have a very successful spring offensive. Any, no one is gonna pull the plug on success. So if they're winning on the battlefield, nobody is gonna stop supporting the Ukrainian cause. Mateo, Vlad, Natalie, and Dan, what an outstanding panel you've been. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you all for coming.